Good evening. It's so good to see each and every one of you tonight. I know I said that about 15 minutes ago, but I mean it. I mean it so much, and we'll say it twice. Um, I hope everyone's had a good week. It's so good to see you. I always like uh, midweek Bible study. That's kind of the pick-me-up during the week, and so I'm so glad to see each and every one of you here. Um, as we continue on our study of First and Second Samuel, just like we ended the class last week, I just want to have a reminder for those who maybe weren't here last week. First and Second Samuel are two books in our Bible. In the original writing, that was one continuous book. That's why chapter 31 of First Samuel and chapter 1 of 2 Samuel fit together so well is because it's actually one composition in the original text. And so here we have, and so why do you think it is, why do you think the split is where it is? What takes place at the end of 1 Samuel, you think somebody thought, you know what, this is a good place to cut it in half right here. All right, we have Saul, right? We have two main kings in First and 2 Samuel, and who are those two kings? Saul and David, right? And what happens at the end of chapter 31? All right, Saul dies. It's roughly kind of in the middle of the two books. Uh, and so one of the kings dies, so why not just cut it off there? And so that's what they did. So here we see the different people who are actually mentioned in the book of Samuel. If you see all the people who are mentioned in the book of Samuel, you see it actually covers quite a span. We started the book out with Eli, who was one of the prophets. Uh, then we have here, Samson was even a judge during the time of Eli. So you can kind of see where the judges ends right here before First and Second Samuel begins. We see Samuel there who was trained by Eli. We see Saul, who was the first anointed king of God's people. His son, Jonathan, who was friends with David, who would then become the second king of God's people. And then Solomon. Was Solomon David's oldest son? No, he was not his oldest son. It is interesting because in the ancient world, who got all the stuff? The firstborn. Is that the way it commonly is done in the Bible? It's actually not. Which is interesting. Because if you look at um, Abraham, does Abraham's oldest son get the blessing? No, who does? Isaac does. Uh, does Isaac's oldest son get the blessing? No, Esau doesn't. Jacob does. Uh, who gets the biggest blessing out of Jacob's kids? Is it his oldest? It's Joseph, right? One of those on the tail end. He gets two portions, right? Uh, Ephraim and Manasseh, both of his sons, get a lot of the portion of, of uh, the 12 tribes of Israel. Two are actually, there's no tribe of Joseph, if you've noticed. That's because Joseph has his part with two of his sons. So his sons get a double portion, if you will. And so the list goes on and on. Whenever we see the son of Jesse, uh, did Jesse's oldest son get to be king? No. Who did? David. Did David's oldest son get to be king? No. It was Solomon. So it's so interesting that the rule, almost without exception in the ancient world, was the oldest son gets the blessing. Hunter, who's older? You're Rex. See, so you're just about luck, man. So you just, nothing. And so that's just the way it was. But even though that's almost the rule without exception in the ancient world, when you look at the Bible, it's almost the exact opposite. Uh, you see it other places, but it actually the blessing as it comes through with Christ doesn't go through the oldest son. It's quite interesting. At least I spent four, five minutes on it, so I thought it was interesting. Um, and so here we have chapter 1. We talked about chapter 1 last week. Uh, I'm going to throw some points on the board. Uh, what do you guys remember about chapter 1 last week? What? All right, David composed a song. Why did he compose a song? He was sad, all right? He was sad because of Saul and David. What was that song called? What was his name? The Bow, right? What is there is there anything in that song that people find interesting that some people try to misconstrue? All right, yeah. The passage says that Jonathan's love was better than a Woman's right, and so there's a big question about what on earth does that mean, right? Is that, is that a sexual love? Is that a friendship love? And we talked about that last week. If you weren't here last week, the video's on YouTube. Okay, so get those views up. No, I'm just playing. Uh, long story short, it's not talking about homosexual love. If you want to know why, 
then seriously look at the video from last week. We can't talk about it, you know, for 10 minutes tonight. Uh, we could, but we'd get behind track, and we're just not going to do it. All right, anyways. All right, anybody remember anything else from last week on chapter 1? Was David excited when he heard that Saul had been killed? No, even though Saul had driven him from his home, had taken his wife away from him and given her to another man, had caused his family to leave their family farm and go, rain, go live in a foreign country, he still wasn't happy. Why was that? He was God's anointed. Even though he was wicked, even though he was evil, even though he tried to kill David, David still saw the fact that he was God's anointed person. And that meant something to David. Because that meant that that, that was God's man. Right? Regardless of, of how wicked he was or mean he was, that's the man God chose to be king. And David wasn't going to take part in his demise or rejoice in his demise. So now we get to chapter 2. David has been crowned king now for, I should have done the research, but I think it's been, it's been over 10 years, I know, since David has been anointed as the upcoming king of Israel. So it's been over 10 years, but now with Saul's death, David's finally going to get to be king, right? I mean, he, after all, he is the anointed one of God's people, right? Wrong. He's not. Well, he actually is in, in, a, in a sense, and he's not in another sense. We're going to figure out why in chapter 2. So why don't we go ahead and let's look at verses 1 through 7 of chapter 2. After this, David requested of the Lord, Shall I go into any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, Go up, David. Go up. David said, To which shall I go up? And he said, To Hebron. So David went up there with his two wives also, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David brought up his new men who were with him, everyone in his household, and they lived in the towns of Hebron. And the men came, of Judah came, and they were anointed David over the king of the house of Judah. And when they, when they told David it was the men of Jabesh Gilead who buried Saul, David sent messengers to Jabesh Gilead and said to them, May May you be blessed by the Lord because you showed this loyalty to Saul, your Lord, and buried him. Now may the Lord show steadfast love and faithfulness to you, and I will do good to you because you have done this thing. Now therefore, let your hands be strong and be valiant, for Saul, your Lord, is dead, and the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. Now I know I'm asking you to do a lot, but I want you to go back to a couple weeks ago. Well, maybe in last week. Do you remember when David got kicked out of the Philistine army? Do y'all remember that? A couple of weeks ago, the Philistines were going to go up and they were going to fight the Israelites. And David has been living in the Philistine country. He's actually a Philistine lord. They give him his own town. He's got 600 warriors. And one of the five Philistine kings says, why don't you come fight with us against these you know, dirty Jews? You know, you're old people that you don't like anymore. And so David says, sure. And so David goes and the Philistine kings say, no, he's not fighting with us. Especially not against the Jews because he's just going to turn on us. And so he goes back home and what happens? What's taking place? All right. All right. His family's all been stolen, right? The other country in the south has come and raided all the people and the land and the possessions. And they've left. So he goes and he gets all the spoil. All right. What was the argument that took place that we talked about? Yeah. He took 200 men and left them behind with the stuff. And the 400 men went and attacked the uh, army, right? And they got back all the wives, all the kids, all the stuff that was taken and more, brought it back. And there was an argument. The 200 guys said, all right, where's our portion? The 400 guys said, you guys are fat and lazy. You couldn't keep up, right? I mean, if you look at the text, it says he left the 200 guys who were, who were tired, right? They got, they got tired of chasing the other army. And they were like, you guys ain't getting nothing. So what does David do? He divided it equally, right? One thing we didn't touch on in that chapter, he also took, he didn't divide all of it equally because he left some back. Does anybody know where he sent the rest of the stuff? To the leaders of the tribes of Judah. Why do you think that was? But let me rephrase this question. Why do you think the, the, the leaders of the tribe of Judah are so quick to recognize David as king when none of the other tribes do. Now let me ask you that question. A couple weeks ago, not here, a couple weeks ago here in the text, 
when David took all that spoil and divided it up and gave it to the leaders of the tribe of Judah, and a couple weeks later, right, he realizes, why do you think the, the tribes of Judah have now accepted David as our king and nobody else did? Yeah, if you're a good politician, what do you do? I don't know. Danny, what do you do? I mean, I'm a, I'm a local resident now. I'm just saying. You wanna... Lie? I don't know. <laughs> now, now, kids, we're not going to play that game, okay? No, we're talking about money, okay? We're talking about gifts, financial gifts. <laughs> Uh, David gave financial gifts, right? He's a politician. He's the man that's going to be king. And so he gives money and gifts to the leaders of Judah. Now when David says, I've been anointed by God to be the next king, the tribes of Judah say, okay, he's the next king. But there's a problem. How many tribes are there of Israelites? There's 12, not including the Levites, right? So if Judah goes with David, why doesn't all the tribes go with David? <laughs> the money ran out, right? That's what happens to Danny's opponents. No, I'm just playing, Danny. I love you. Um, but I will take money if you have any. Uh, <laughs> and so what happens? Well, let's, let's figure out what happens, okay? You've got Abner. Abner was the general, right? He's the power behind the throne, okay? And so when his king, Saul, is killed... And three of his sons, but it's not all of his sons. There's still one left back. And so Abner decides, I've been, I've been chasing Daniel, I mean David, to the woods for the last decade. I'm not just going to lay over and let him be king, right? I mean, I, I mean this, this is not going to happen on my watch. And so he sets up a puppet king. And we see here in verses 8 through 11, let's take a moment to read that. But Abner, the son of Ner, commander of Saul's army, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim and made him king over Gilead and the Asherites and Jezreel and Ephraim and Benjamin and all of Israel. And Ishbaseth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel, and he reigned two years. But the house of Judah followed David. And that time David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah seven years and six months. So how long was David king over only a portion of God's people, even after Saul had died? Seven years, right? I mean, you've got to give something about David's patience. I mean... Samuel comes to David and says, you're going to be known a king of God's people. He has to wait over ten years for Saul to die and leave him alone. And he's got to wait seven years for the rest of the tribes of Israel to finally come around. I mean, there's something to be said about David's trust and faith in God and his patience. Right? And uh, as an impatient person myself sometimes, I can do a lot to learn from David's patience. So here Abner sets up this puppet king. He's 40 years old. It has been estimated now... We can't know for certain that Saul was probably in his 70s by the time he dies in chapter 31. And so he's not a, a young man. I mean, this is one of his younger sons, and he's 40 years old, taking over as the king. And so the two kingdoms fight. We're not going to read that whole passage. But in verses 12 through 32, it's kind of an interesting story. The two armies kind of meet. All right, you've got David, his warriors, and the soldiers of Judah facing against Ishbaseth and the uh, other eleven tribes of Israel. Who's got the bigger army? You ain't got to read ahead. It's eleven tribes to one. Yeah, you ain't got to say his name because I think I butchered it too. Okay, the other guys. Okay, the non-David teams got more people. All right, and so they had this standoff, right? They're not doing anything. It's kind of like before a football game. You know what I'm talking about? Like the teams are centered. Loser. I got a story I want to tell you real quick because we got time. I think so. All right, I was in high school, played football. You know, the captains come out first for the coin toss, whatever. The other teams lined up. Don't know who it was. Doesn't matter. I'm lined up. You got the mean mug face going on. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I'm five foot eight and a half, but I'll tear you apart. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, <laughs> you know. My cousin comes up, you know, lined up. He gives me a hug and says, love you, cuz, and gives me a kiss on the cheek. And I'm like, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> like, you know, like, you got to be kidding me. He was like 27, okay? It was kind of awkward. And I thought, 
We still won, but they chuckled, and I couldn't blame them either. I was just kind of like, that shot. Anyways, moving on. Okay, so this is kind of taking place. These two armies kind of just camp out, and they look at each other, right? It's like two guys trying to get in a fight. Like, no, you throw the first swing. No, you throw the first swing. No, 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 you throw the first swing. No, I mean, you throw the first swing. And so they do this for a couple of days, and they just get tired. They're like, this is stupid, okay? Like, you pick out your best ten, we'll pick out our best ten, and let's just do something. That's what takes place. And so these two people fight. Well, if you've got 10 on 10, it doesn't matter how many people are in the stands, right? Or how many how many's on the team. you just got the 10 captains out on the field. And so the Judeans win. And so this kind of stirs up the other 11 tribes. They take off. There's a fight that ensues. They fight back and forth. Um, what are we talking about? All the fight, yeah. And so there's a fight that ensues. And so there is uh, three brothers who are really good warriors, okay? But you got to give it to Abner. Not only is Abner the general of the opposing forces, he's like the best fighter in Israel. Like, he's, he's better than David. He's better than Saul. I mean, there's a reason why he's the general. He's the best fighter. And so one of the other brothers who's one of the best fighters on David's team is really fast. And he's running after Abner. And he's chasing Abner. And Abner's saying, like, dude, leave me alone. And the dude just keeps chasing after Abner. He's like, dude, I'm telling you, leave me alone. The dude doesn't... Third time, he comes, Abner just kills him. He's like, I'm tired of running. I I warned you twice. This is going to be important later on, okay? But after the fight is over with... We see here that uh, it's just a landslide victory. Uh, the David's guys, David loses 20 men. The other team loses 360. Really good odds. Okay, so now let's go on to chapter... Well, before we go into chapter 3, here you see Israel and Judah. And so this would have been the territory that we're talking about. David would have been king over the green section, the section there in the south. That would have been the land that Judah and some of the Benjamites had. Okay? And so the red would have been the land of Abner and Ish-Baseth. Okay? And so here you kind of see what the distinction is. Anybody see a town kind of right there where the two lines meet? Jerusalem. Okay? Jerusalem is not a city yet owned by the Israelites. It will be soon. That's why we're going to call it David City because he's the one that actually drives the Jebusites out. And so now we get to chapter 3. Oh, I'm sorry. Does anybody have any questions or comments on chapter 2? No? Okay. Yes, there will be better illustrations in chapter 3. I'm sorry about that. Okay. All right. Chapter 3. All right. Let's look at verses 1 through 5. There was a king, I'm sorry, there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, and David grew stronger and stronger, while the house of Saul became weaker and weaker. Now pay attention, this is important. And the sons were born to David at Hebron. The firstborn was Amnon of Ahinoam, I'm sorry, Ahinoam of Jezreel, his second Shiliab of Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel, the third Absalom, the son of Micah, the daughter of Tamal, the king of Geshur, the fourth Adonijah, the son of Higeth, the fifth uh, Sephathiah, the son of Ebital, the sixth Ithrium of Eglah, David's wife, there were born to David a Hebron. All right. Yes, I, I butchered those names. I'm sorry. Um, I know what you're thinking. He just said this is really important, and we just read some just random names. Why is this passage important? Look, see this book right here? It covers about 7,000 years, okay? 99.99% uh, of the stuff that's happened since the earth began is not in this book. So every verse is important. So why are these four verses important? There's so much in David's life that we don't know anything about. Why does the Holy Spirit think it's important for us to have this passage? What is it trying to say? Don't be shy. I know you know it. All right, had a lineage. All right. Good answer. Not what we're really going for, but I'm, I'm just going to give you a gold star because you said something. All right. I appreciate that. Everybody else is looking at me like, well, we've got 11 minutes more of this stuff before the bell rings. It wasn't the first. In my opinion, that's not the point of the passage, but 
Like I said, I appreciate correspondence here. I just want to hear something, even if it's not what I consider to be technically right. All right? All right? Is it six or five? I thought it was six. Is it six? It's a bunch, right? Five or six is illegal, right? You know, I don't know what to... Um, The key, the key is verse 1. There was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, and David grew stronger and stronger while the house of Saul became weaker and weaker. All right? In the ancient world, these passages show us two things. Number one, money. You don't have a wife unless you have money. I see a lot of wealthy people in here tonight, right? Okay? You don't have multiple wives unless you're really wealthy. You don't have six wives unless you're super wealthy. Right? This passage is saying, not only is David fighting a war, he's getting super stinking rich. Super rich. That's important in the ancient world, right? Money's power. Okay? The ancient world, when you have a child, it is a blessing from God. How long is David in Hebron? Seven and a half years? In seven and a half years, he has six sons. Because daughters don't count, okay? He has six sons by six women in seven years. Not only is he stinking rich, but God loves him. I mean, that's, that's, what, that's what this passage is saying. He has God's approval. If there's, if there's ever anybody's doubt in Israel who God is rooting for during this seven-year-long war, it's definitely David because he's getting stinking rich and he's having sons left and right. I mean, what this passage is trying to say is, is that David is God's man. Not only is he rich, but God is blessing him with son after son after son. Right? And so, is Ricky Swinney here tonight? No? We'll get on to him later, okay? Um... But he's one of five brothers, right? In the ancient world, that would have been like the family, okay? You know, to have, and I mean, Brother Ed, how many brothers is in, is in your group? Well, all right, anybody beat that? No? A darties win again. All right, never mind. <laughs> I'm joking, Brother Ed, I love you. Okay, all right. And so this passage is trying to say that, you know, David's the man. I mean, he's just... He's just everything that the typical Jewish male wants to be. Okay, verses 6 through 11, Ishbaseth makes a huge mistake. The only reason he's king is because of Abner. All right, verses 6 through 11, he comes in and he accuses Abner of having sexual relations with his father's concubine. Well, the passage doesn't say whether Abner did or did not, but Abner gets super offended. Uh, perhaps he did not do it, and that's why he becomes super offended. Abner was probably a person of character. Uh, yes, he followed after David for years on end, but to his credit, Saul was the king of Israel. He was God's anointed, and so Abner served him faithfully. Now, we don't know if Abner was even aware that David was, in fact, God's anointed, but by this time, not only is David beginning rich, he's got sons, and he's gaining territory. Abner has seen the right on the wall, God has chosen David. Not only that, this little punk has just accused him of sexual immorality. So Abner says, you know what, I'm out. I'm just gone. And so he gets offended by the king, and he defects to David. He goes in verses 12 through 21 to David, and he talks to David, and he says, look, David, the only reason this guy's in power is because I want him to be in power. I mean, that's just how much clout and pull I have with the rest of the tribes in Israel. And if you want me to, if you can give me a sweet enough deal, I'll give the kingdom to you. Like, you know, I'll, I'll take the other, the other clansmen and the elders of the different tribes, and I'll just bring them to you. At my word, they'll be in. And so David's like, yeah. And so Abner doesn't tell anybody what he's doing. He, he defects to David. He goes back. Well, remember what I said earlier, what Abner did? Somebody tell me what Abner did during the battle. What? Okay, I got louder. What did you say, Brittany? Yeah, you did. You liar. <laughs> Somebody's coming forward Sunday. Right. I said, um, I don't remember who was killed, but it was one of David's 
Yeah, one of David's men, uh, specifically Danny. Yeah, yeah. Who was? He was a swift guy. He was very fast, but he was also one of three brothers who were kind of like the mighty men of David, if you will. You know, there's about 33 guys, I think, 30-something guys we'll talk about later who are the mighty men of David. This guy was one of them, along with his brothers. So when his brothers see Abner leaving David's camp, they're like, oh, wait a minute. I don't think so. And so they're like, Abner, come over here real quick. Got a question for you. And so he comes over there, and then they just kill him. They just, that's a problem. Because what is what has Abner just been conditioned or commissioned to do? Yeah, bring the rest of the kingdom to David. <laughs> so David's just like, they tell David, David finds out what's happening. He's just like, like you idiots. <laughs> like, you know, what are you doing? You know, and so Abner defects to David, but Joab, ki- Joab, who becomes David's general, kills Abner. David gets really upset, and he throws a curse upon jo- Joab and his family because, uh, because he killed um, Abner without telling him, and Abner was supposed to take the message to the tribesmen to defect Ishbosheth and go with him. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting because, as I mentioned before, Ish, Ishbosheth, I mean, he could have been an idiot. I mean, we don't really have much about him. But it's pretty clear from the Bible the only reason he's in power is Abner. Okay, so maybe you've got Ishbosheth thinking, okay, wait a minute, who's really in charge here? Is it me or is it Abner? And so. By saying you have had relations with my father's concubine, he is accusing Abner of overstepping into royalty and trying to um, taking the king's property makes you the king. And so it's an accusation not only of sexual immorality, but also of Abner trying to be subversive to Ishbosheth as king. Right, Brother Rich? Yeah. Yeah, well, he was definitely running the show. I mean, he was, he was definitely the power behind the throne. And so, absolutely. Well, guys, I'm just tickled pink. I think we can do chapter four tonight, too. Any questions or comments so far? Nope. I told you illustrations would be better. Okay, so in chapter four, we're introduced to Meth is Bathsheth. Okay, verse 4. Okay, let's, let's read that again. Chapter 4, verse 4. Stop, honey, you're making me laugh. <laughs> Jonathan, the son of Saul, had a son who was crippled in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled, and as she fled in her haste, he fell and became lame, and his name was Mithibosheth. Okay. All right. So, yeah. Say that ten times real fast. Um, so. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> uh, we're going to call him male for short, all right? Or Mep. No. All right, anyways, whose who's son is he? He's Jonathan's son, all right? Why is that important? Best friends, right? And David made a promise to Saul. What was his promise? Yeah, exactly. And so we're going to see David keep that promise to Saul later on as these next few chapters unfold. But here in chapter 4, we're going to be introduced to him. And verses 1 through 8, that's even misspelled. Anyways, uh, the king is killed. The king of the eleven tribes are killed. Ish is killed. And so here we have no king. And so in verses 8 through 12, let's go ahead and read that passage. Because it sounds a lot like something else that happened previously. 
And he brought the head of Ish-bosheth to David at Hebron, and they said to the king, Here is the head of Ish-bosheth, the son of Saul, your enemy, who sought your life. The Lord has avenged my lord the king on this day, Saul and his offspring. But David answered Rechab and Benai, his brother, the sons of Ramon, of Bithrite, and the Lord, as the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life out of every adversity, when one told me, Behold, Saul was dead, and thought he was bringing good news, I seized him and killed him at Ziklag, which was a reward I gave to him for his news. How much more, when wicked men have killed a righteous man in his own house on his bed, shall I not require his blood at your hand and destroy you from the earth? And David commanded his young men, and they killed him and cut off their heads, their hands, and their feet, and hanged them beside the pool of Hebron. And they took the head of Ishbaseth and buried it in the tomb of Abner at Hebron. Okay, what happened when Saul died? Who brought the news to David? It was an Amalekite, right? He brings the head of David's enemy to his feet, and he's expecting a handsome reward. Well, what happens? That's right. David kills him, right? Uh, David says, if you killed Saul, God's anointed, I'm going to kill you. And so, what happens here in this passage? It's almost verbatim. These guys, well, these guys actually killed Ish, right? The other dude didn't really kill Saul. He just, he just grabbed his head and brought it to David and said, here, you know, I'm, I've, I've killed, killed Saul. These guys actually killed Ish. And so they come and tell David the news, and David's like, did you not hear what happened to when the guys came and told me they killed Saul? What happened to those guys? Well, newsflash, I killed them, I'm going to kill you today. And that's what he did. He had them cut off their hands and their feet, and then he killed them. And he took the head of Ish, and he buried it in the tomb of Abner there in Hebron. And so here we have chapters 2, 3, and 4 of 2 Samuel. Uh, we're going to continue on. If you'd like to read on for next week, I encourage you to do so. Please read chapters 5, 6, and 7. Uh, we may not get all three of those chapters done next week, but uh, if you read those, maybe you'll have some insights. And, and if I go off in left field, at least you'll know something about the text. Um, are there any questions or comments about the things we've discussed so far? Yes, John. I'm curious. Back, back in chapter 3, verse uh, 29, David cursed Joab and his family. Yes. And whatever happened about that curse, he had the power to Assuming that he takes the place. Yeah. David had the power to make it happen. He did. And we know that it doesn't happen then. Not only does it not happen then, but Joab actually becomes the general when David does consolidate power, sets up his throne in Jerusalem. You remember David has Joab put your rye in the thick of the fight there in First Samuel chapter eleven. And so uh, but Joab's day is coming. Uh, Joab is going to be uh, killed and uh, this curse is going to take fruition. It is interesting though here that he doesn't as you were saying, David had the power to kill him if he wanted to. In fact he's already demonstrated this power with the messenger of Saul and these guys who brought the message of Ish. And so I don't know. Maybe David gave them some leeway because they were avenging their brother um, under the old law. Yeah, well, I mean, he was, yeah. I mean, Joab was a, was a general, right? He was a great general uh, from what we can see. I mean, he was extremely successful uh, in his battles as David enlarged the territory of Israel as it had never been enlarged before, uh, with mostly Joab being the main general of that, those expeditions. And so it's a good question, John. But he says, he says uh, and, and on all his father's house, and let ne there never fail to be in the house of Joab one who has a discharge or is a leper who leans on a staff or fail fall or falls by the sword or who lacks bread. Mm -hmm. Yeah, David was upset. I mean, did this did it come to fruition? It does. It does. We're going to see that in later on in Second Samuel, where and it's interesting. Um, because there's a lot of questions we could ask. We could ask, okay, since David gives this curse when Joab's ruin does come, is it because David gave the curse or is David kind of giving a prophetic speech? 
Or does, does David curse Joab because he's having a message from God? Because we know David had the Spirit of God and was able to prophesy. Or does David make the curse and then God follow through with the cursing because that's what David said? And not just Joab, but his, his, whole his whole family. Yeah. Well, in the ancient world, I mean, that's, you know, Korah's rebellion, right? Everybody dies. Uh, in Esther, right? When, um, oh, what's his name? What's that dude's name? Haman. Haman, right? You know, it's not just Haman, but it's, it's Haman and his family that gets, that gets killed. And so, I don't know. The Joab and his brothers had the right to kill Abner under the old law. Blood revenge, right? They, they, they were his... Um, there's, a, there's a term for it. Uh, whatever it is, they had the right to avenge their brother's death under the old law, right? But they should have asked David because this is a war and David's a king and David sent Abner out on a message. Maybe that's why David didn't kill them automatically but, and, but at the same time still blesses them, if that makes sense. Um, Well, it was self-defense. I mean, Abner warned him three times, or, or two times, and killed him the third time to leave him alone, right? So would they have actually had the right to kill him under the old law? That's a good question. Uh, the old law deals more with murder. And yeah. Yeah, the old law deals with murder, and so this is this is war. So I don't know. Maybe they didn't technically have the right in their minds. They felt like they did have a right, uh, but yeah. Well, that's because he was running so fast. I don't know. I'm just saying. It just said said he was just really fast. I don't know. I don't. It's a good question. I wasn't there, so I'm not 100 percent sure. Uh, but good questions. Um, any other? Does anybody have a takeaway from these three passages, these three chapters for our life? And I know we're out of time, but just I feel like we should always have at least some sort of present day application. Yeah, everything was a little bit grittier back then, huh? Um, don't run fast into a stick. That's good, right? It's, pra it's practical. What about maybe like practical slash spiritual application? What about, about one of the, which I should have clarified. Uh, I think one of the biggest takeaways uh, is trust. I mean, uh, David was told you're going to be king of God's people. Was it easy? Most certainly not. Did it cost him? Yeah. His wife, whom he loved, apparently was taken away and given another guy, right? And uh, did it take a long time? About 20 years. And so, you know, God has made promises, but sometimes we've got to be faithful. God has promised us an eternity in heaven. Can we trust Him? Is it going to be easy? No. It's going to take some time? It's going to take some disappointments? Is it going to be worth it? Absolutely, right? David stayed the course and so do we. And so thank you so much for your attendance and we'll close the prayer. Thank you. Dear God, thank you for this day and for all the blessings you've given us. Thank you so much for your word and for the wisdom that it entails and gives to our lives. Dear Heavenly Father, please help us to be like your servants, uh, David and the other ones that surrounded him and are patient uh, for the blessings that are coming in your own time. Help us to be faithful to you in all things that we do and help us to have a desire to study your word that it might better, uh, better apply to our lives. It's your sons and we pray. Amen.